topic tonight is what happens when we die? And this is a question that has perplexed mankind for thousands of years. There's not a person in this room that hasn't been affected by death of some sort. We all begin to face our mortality the older we get. And that raises a question in our mind. What happens when I die? Over the ages, people in every society have pondered the subject. And there is really no shortage of proposed answers that people will come up with. It's tremendous if you talk to different people, the different ideas that people have about what happens when we die. Many people believe that there's heaven and there's hell. We've heard that. Probably most of us here believe that. Yet others believe in reincarnation. And we're not here to pick on anybody that doesn't believe what we don't believe. Answers to the question what happens when we die are as diverse as the people who give the ideas about the customs and beliefs. But most religions agree on one fundamental thing. Whether you believe whatever type of thing you believe about what happens after we die, most religions agree that something inside a person, whether that be a soul or a spirit or a ghost, they believe that that's immortal and continues living after death. We want the Bible answer. Amen? Amen? We want to see what the Bible says about this topic. Some wonder, does it really matter? Is this really a topic that, that we should discuss? Does it matter what I believe? Well, I'm here to tell you tonight, I believe this matters tremendously. What happens when we die will have a profound impact on what happens to us in the end times. How we believe it will have an impact on us. So we can't guess. And that's why we've developed this topic for tonight. Let me say at the outset, you're going to hear some things that maybe you've never heard before. I'm going to ask you to stay through. Hear it through. And there's going to be a lot of questions that are going to come up as we go through this. You're going to have many, many questions. And you're probably going to raise an eyebrow or two. You might want to throw a tomato at me. Here or there. But listen to what God's Word says. And there's going to be a lot more that I could go into. This lecture also could be four or five hours long very easily. So we tried to cram it all into, into uh, one hour. So let's move along. We're going to do this much like we did the other night. The first question is, how did God create man? How did God create man? Look at this verse here in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. It says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became... What? He became a living soul. Notice it doesn't say that God gave him a soul. It doesn't say anything about him having a soul. It simply says he became a living soul. Are you with me? Next question. What happens when a person dies? You didn't think we were going to get there that quick, did you? <laughs> you thought I was going to drag this out and keep you waiting. Well, I am a little bit. Let's take a look at the text here. Ecclesiastes 12, 7 says, Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. Have you heard that before? Many of us I know have. The body, it says, returns to the dust, and the spirit returns to God. The spirit of every person dies. Here's what you have to remember. The spirit of every person who dies, whether you're righteous or you're wicked, it returns to God at death. It doesn't say the spirit of a, of a righteous man, does it? It says the spirit will return to God who gave it. Didn't God give his spirit to every man that's living, every woman that's alive? Absolutely. So whether you're righteous or you're wicked, the Spirit returns to God at death. Let the Bible speak for itself. Psalm 104, 29 says, You take away their breath, and they die and return to their dust. Does that make sense? All right. Next question. What is the Spirit that returns to God at death? This is the question that a lot of people want to see. What is the Spirit? Well, the Bible tells us in James chapter 2, 26, it says, The body without the spirit is dead. And then Job 27, 3 says, The spirit of God is in my nostrils. Have you ever heard that before? 
the Spirit of God in your nostrils? What do we use our nostrils to do? Breathe. To breathe. That's exactly right. We use our nostrils to breathe. And the Spirit that returns to God at death is the breath of life. Does that make sense? The fact is, nowhere in the Bible does the Spirit, which God gave to mankind, nowhere in the Bible does it says it has any life or wisdom or feeling after a person dies. If you can find that text, I want you to share it with me after this. Track me down and we'll, we'll look at that together. But it's not in there. The Spirit is simply the breath of life and nothing more. That's all the Spirit is. Let's continue. Question four, what is a soul? This is another question a lot of people have. It says in Genesis 2, 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. We just read this, didn't we? And man became a living soul. So a soul, remember I said God didn't put into the man a soul, but he became a soul. A living soul, or a soul is a living being. A soul is a living being. A soul is always a combination of two things. You have to have the body and the breath. If either one of these cease to exist, if the breath goes out, the soul ceases to exist. They have to be combined. <coughs> combined. These four people that you see here are four souls. They're alive and well. Nice looking family. The soul ceases to exist when the breath leaves the body. That's a new concept for you, isn't it? For some of you. Let's continue on. Do souls die? Many of us believe that when we die, the soul lives on, goes to heaven or hell. Most people believe that, that are Christian. But do souls die? Well, the Bible says in Ezekiel 18, 4, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. That's pretty clear. So according to the Bible, the soul dies. We are souls if we're living and breathing. And souls die. Man is mortal at this point. Only God is immortal. Okay. The whole concept of an undying soul or immortal soul, where, where did that come from? It goes against the Bible. The Bible does not teach that the soul is immortal. It teaches that souls are subject to death. The breath goes out and they cease to exist. I'm going to give you an illustration here. I tried to make this chart. I copied this from another. This is actually in the handout that you'll get at the end of tonight. And um, by the way, while I'm thinking about that, I don't want to derail this, but any handout from the other nights, from the previous nights, you can find on the back table. We still have some. We still have them back there. So if you missed either night, feel free to go back there and get a handout. But this chart came out of the handout you'll get tonight. The body is dust. The breath is the spirit. If you take the breath away, you see the little minus sign? If you take the breath away, that equals death. You cease to exist. You decay. You turn back to the dust. That's what God told Adam. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return, right? <coughs> Have you ever read that text? We're going to read it in a minute if you haven't. Do good people go to heaven when they die? Excellent question. Look what... Jesus said in John 5, 28 and 29, he said, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Where are those who are dead? What's it say? The hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. That sounds pretty clear. Look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 29 and 34. It says, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, King David. King David was called a man after God's own heart. Okay? This man, he had his problems, but he repented and he was a godly man. King David we're talking about. So let's start that again. Let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. For David did not ascend into the heavens. Now wait a minute. If he's a man after God's own heart, how did he not go to heaven? How did that happen? While he will be saved in God's kingdom, the Bible tells us that he's in the grave now, and he awaits the resurrection, which is future. Let me back up. What's that say? The hour is coming. In other words, it hasn't come yet. 
the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Okay? So the answer is no. People do not either go to heaven or hell at death. Now don't get me wrong. I'm not saying there's no heaven or hell. We're going to get to that. But if, when we die, we don't go there. We simply return to the dust. We go to our graves and we wait for the resurrection day. That's a new concept to many of you, am I right? That's, that sounds new. And it might break on you a little bit because sometimes we want to imagine that my grandma and my grandpa's in heaven and they're looking down right now and they're proud of what I'm doing. But as we go through this, we'll see where my grandma and my grandpa are. Question number seven. How much does one know or comprehend after death? If I die, what do I know? Well, let's take a look at several texts. Ecclesiastes 9.5, it says, For the living know that they will die, but the dead, what? Nothing. Know nothing. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also, their love, their hatred, their envy, all of their emotions, in other words, have now perished. What does perish mean? They're gone. They're no more. Nevermore will they have a share in anything done under the sun. And that's talking about in this world. Okay, we'll talk about that more tomorrow night. We're going we're gonna to set the stage for, for tomorrow night's lesson. Ecclesiastes 9 10 says, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. Does this text make it clear? Do we have any conscious awareness in death? The dead know absolutely nothing according to these verses that we're reading at this time. Well, that may raise another question in your mind. You might say, but can't the dead communicate with the living? Aren't, aren't they aware of what the living are doing? Have you ever heard of a seance? You ever hear people summoning the dead? People try this all the time. Some of you may have done it. Some of you may have done it. But look what the Bible says. Job chapter 14, it says, So man lies down and does not rise till the heavens are no more. They will not awake nor be rose from their sleep, or roused from their sleep. His sons come to honor, and he does not know it. In other words, my grandpa's in the grave. If I go, or my dad goes to honor him, he doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't see it. It says they are brought low, and he does not perceive it. Why? Because he's conscious of nothing. So the answer is no. The dead cannot contact the living, nor do they know what the living are doing. Because they are dead. We are alive. Life is conscious awareness. Death is just the opposite. May sound new to some of you. And as we read in Ecclesiastes 9, 5, and 10, it says their, their thoughts have perished. There's no work or device or knowledge or wisdom. Isn't that what we just read? So we have to put these texts together and look at it. Psalm 146, 3 and 4 says, Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth, and that day his thoughts perish. So again, we see the body without the breath equals death. It says it right there. His breath goes out, he returns to the earth, his thoughts perish, he ceases to exist, in other words. Some will say, wait a minute, hold on. You're going through this thing so fast, you're not hitting any of the controversial scriptures. Don't worry, we're going to do it. We're going to look at some of the texts that I know are rattling around in your mind right now. I know some of you are thinking, there's a lot of Bible students out here. Some will say, the body dies, but the soul lives on. I've heard that. But, didn't we just read in Ezekiel 18.4 that the soul that sins, it shall die? That's a uh, can we rip that verse out of the Bible? Again, the whole concept of an undying immortal soul goes against the Bible, which teaches that right here, we see that souls do die. The soul that sins, it shall die. So death is ceasing to exist. Also, the psalmist in Psalm 115, 17 says, The dead do not praise the Lord, nor do any who go down into silence. So if you have no knowledge or wisdom, how could you praise the Lord? Are you starting to see a, a pattern here? Maybe you don't like this too much. I'm not sure, but this is what the Bible says. This is God's word that we're examining. Even though many think it's possible, the dead cannot communicate with the living. In fact, Jesus called the unconscious state of the dead sleep. You've heard that, right? You've heard Jesus call it sleep. We're going to examine a text. Let's take a look at a text. 
Let's open our Bibles to John chapter 11. And this is a story that probably most of us here are very familiar with. John chapter 11. In your seminar Bible, it's page 1038. Now I'm going to set this up for you a little bit. This is uh, the story of Lazarus, who was one of Jesus' friends. And Jesus was away, and they sent for Jesus, and they wanted him to come back because Lazarus was sick. Well, let me tell you, Jesus delayed. He delayed, and he did it on purpose. He should have, people thought that he should have went right back, and he should have healed Lazarus. But he delayed on purpose, and here's the reason why. Um, here we go. Look at verse 5. Let's start. 11 verse 5. I just want you to see this. It says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Is that because Jesus didn't love him? No. Jesus did this for a reason. The reason he delayed two more days, you know, Jesus was very controversial to the religious leaders of the day. He didn't preach the message that most of them were teaching. They had a problem with him because of some of the things that he was doing. They knew what the scriptures said, but they didn't necessarily teach the things the way that he wanted them taught. And what had happened was he stayed a couple of extra days so that he could teach a lesson not just to them, but show people who he really was. And Jewish tradition has it that if you, anyone has slept in the grave for more than three days, there's no coming back. You cannot resurrect anyone, according to Jewish tradition, who's been in the tomb for more than three days. So what did Jesus do? He waited four I love it. It seems like he was a rebel if you think about it, but he wasn't. He was teaching a lesson. He was a man of love. And, and let's see here. Let's pick it up in verse 17. So when Jesus came, chapter 11, verse 17. Everybody there? You ready? So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been dead in the tomb for how many? Four days. Four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined women, joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother, their, their, their loss of Lazarus. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had just been here, my brother would not have died. Verse 22, but even now I know that whatever you ask God, God will give you. That's faith, isn't it? Whatever you ask, I know God will give you. Verse 23, Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Pay attention here. Look at what Martha says. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. What? Wait a minute. Wasn't Lazarus in heaven? He was a righteous man. He was Jesus' friend. Where was he? Where was Lazarus? Jesus says, your brother will rise again. Martha says to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Now let me ask you, in reading this text right here, we're going to continue, but does Martha have any concept that Lazarus is in heaven? Or in some kind of heavenly realm? None. None whatsoever. No concept. Let's continue on. Verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. And he said these things. She went away, secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, The teacher is coming, calling for you. Well, if you, we don't have to read all of this text, but in your personal study, and I'm going to advise you to do it, read this text at home and pray about it. Take a look at verse 33. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Why was Jesus upset? Why was he groaning in the spirit? Because these folks lacked faith. Jesus wasn't sad. He knew that he was there to resurrect Lazarus. He knew he was going to call him out of the tomb. But he wept because these people 
didn't really believe that he could do it. So, verse 34 says, And he said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And there it is, shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him? They must have understood, didn't they? See how he loved him? And some of them, uh, let's see, and some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Well, of course he could. He was teaching them a lesson. So the key is in verse 39, Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, at this time there is a stench, for he's been dead for four days. In other words, his body has started to rot. It stinks in there. And Jesus prays a prayer. Verse 41 at the bottom. I thank you that you have heard me. And he goes on in verse 43 to say, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus comes out of the tomb. Take a look. He cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out, bound hand and foot with frayed clothes. There's no report of Lazarus ever saying anything about, Lord, what in the world are you doing? I was in heaven enjoying myself, and you called me back down to this cesspool. I mean, think about it. Wouldn't you be upset if you were in heaven, and you're next to God and the angels? And then he calls you back down here? You know, if this happened today, Larry King would be in his face with a microphone. What'd you see? Four days in the tomb, what'd you see? He saw nothing. So, notice what Jesus says repeatedly about the resurrection. Notice this. This is very interesting. John chapter 6, verse 39. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing. But should raise it up when? At the last day. Take a look at John chapter 6, verse 40. It says, And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son of Man and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up when? <coughs> At the last day. It goes on. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up. At the last day. You see what's happening here? Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, this is talking about the communion service. If any of you are not familiar with that, if you've ever been to church, many times you have the, the juice and the bread. The juice represents the blood, and the bread represents the flesh of Jesus. And this is what we would call the communion service. It says they have eternal life, and I will raise him up when he dies at the last day. For emphasis, what was Martha's understanding of where Lazarus was? He was dead. He didn't exist. There was no thinking. There was no thought. His flesh was returning to the dust. The spirit had returned to God, which was the breath of life. Without the body and the breath, we cease to exist. Does that make sense? Is it starting to make a little more sense? So according to the Bible, the dead sleep also until the great day of the Lord, at the last day or at the second coming of Christ. The resurrection is when Jesus comes back. It's not when we die. In death, humans are totally unconscious. No activity, no awareness. We cease to exist until the resurrection. And this brings up another question. Okay? Well, how does the Bible repeatedly refer to death? Let's take a look. Psalm 13, 3, it says, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God, and lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. We see again, here are some other texts. Now, this is just some. There are many more. I, don't, I can't remember. I don't think this is in the handout tonight. But on the final night, I'm giving out a handout that will have an outline of every topic we've discussed in much more depth than what you're getting each night. So I'm trying to get you to come back. Hopefully you'll come back. But these are some of the texts. You don't have to write them down. All you have to do is be here Saturday night. You'll get a handout with these very texts in it and many more. Okay? These are some of the texts where death is sleep. In fact, Jesus calls death sleep. It's a total state of, of unconsciousness, right? Isn't that what we established? <coughs> Much like a dreamless sleep. How many of you have ever fallen asleep at night? And you wake up. 
Do you have any concept of what time it is? You don't know if you've been asleep for 30 seconds, or 30 minutes, or 3 or 4 hours. Am I right? <coughs> it's dark outside. You look at your watch and say, oh, boy, I must have fallen asleep. You don't even know you're asleep until you wake up. Right? Have you ever had a dreamless sleep where the night just goes through? You fall asleep, dreamless sleep, you wake up in the morning, 8 o'clock, you say, whoa, I'm supposed to be at work by now. <coughs> right? The other thing, an illustration that came to me, I was uh, having a Bible study with a man, and he had cancer. His name was Jonathan. And he called me when he knew he was getting ready to die. And he asked me to come to his house. And I went over there and we sat down and he wanted to know what happens to me when I die. I really want to know. And we went through these texts. Now, I could have told him, well, Jonathan, you know what? As soon as you die, you're going to be transported to heaven. And you're going to be there. But you know, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't tell me that. The Bible says when I die, I return to the dust and I'm sleeping until the resurrection day when Jesus comes back. And when I shared this with him, he was so comforted. He was so comforted. Not only that, but the illustration that came to me, he had just been through 16 surgeries because of his cancer. And I asked him, I said, did they ever give you, uh, knock you out for that? Did they give you gas? And he said, oh, absolutely. I've been, you know, knocked out many times. I said, well, do you remember anything about the surgery? He said, no. Do you, did you feel anything? He said, no. I said, how long were you out? He says, well, the worst surgery that I had was 17 hours. And I remember going into the operating room in the morning. It was a beautiful day. And when I woke up, it was 17 hours later, and I thought that they hadn't done it yet. And I said, Jonathan, that's the experience of death. When you lay to rest, you don't know anything. Your next conscious thought will be seeing Jesus coming in the clouds. That's a beautiful thought. It comforted him. And that's what the Bible teaches. Let's continue on. Question number 10. What happens to the righteous dead at the sec second coming of Christ? What happens to those? You see, there's two groups of people, aren't there? The righteous and the unrighteous. What happens to the righteous? Let's cover that first. Hopefully we're all here. We're, we consider ourselves righteous. I do. I've got to admit it. I believe if Jesus comes today, I'm going to be going with him. Maybe I'm wrong, but I believe I will. Revelation 22, 12 says, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. This is talking about the righteous. His reward is with him to give to the righteous. His reward will be with him to give to the unrighteous also. We'll talk about that a little later. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have, there it is again, fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. And 1 Thessalonians 4.16 This is one of my favorite verses in Thessalonians. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. So when will the righteous dead be raised? Are they in heaven now? What does the Bible say? They will be raised when Jesus comes back. When the Lord himself descends. When the trumpet blasts. You know, I always love to say this when I was a kid. My mom used to say, boy, you better be quiet. You're going to wake the dead. Well, that's what Jesus is going to do when he blows, blows that trumpet. Think about that. She didn't say it like that. I always like to exaggerate when I'm talking about my mom getting on my case. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. So think about this. Notice what 1 Corinthians 15, 51 says. It says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And we'll talk more about that tomorrow. We're going to spend quite a bit of time in these texts tomorrow evening. We're going to be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. Same lingo that was used there in... Thessalonians, right? Paul wrote this also, the Apostle Paul did. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible. This is talking about the righteous. And we shall all be changed. And then it goes on. For this corruptible, this sinful body that we have now, 
must put on incorruption, and the mortal body that dies must put on immortality. And you say, well, wait a minute. He said the word immortal didn't exist in one place. This is immortality. Okay, I did say the word immortal only appears one time in the Bible, and that's referring to God. But he will give us the gift of immortality, <coughs> something that he gives us through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. The righteous living and the righteous dead receive immortality when Jesus comes back. In other words, if I'm in the tomb, if I die tonight, and I'm in the tomb, and Jesus doesn't come for another 5, 50, or 100 years, however long it is, I'll be given immortality if I'm raised in the resurrection of the righteous. And those who are living will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. That's 1 Thessalonians. Now, I want you to think about something. If the dead are in heaven now, if the righteous dead are in heaven now, wouldn't they already have immortality? If they were in heaven now, there would be no purpose for resurrection. Isn't that right? If people were taken to heaven at death, what's the purpose of a resurrection? There is none. You might remember this question from last Saturday night. What was the, the devil's first lie on the earth? You remember? That's right. Very good. Genesis 3, verse 4. The serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. Not only was this the first lie that was ever told, but it was one of the biggest lies that's ever been perpetrated on humankind. Many of us have been taught that when I die, I don't really die. I've been to so many funerals where the preacher has preached someone right into heaven right now that's looking at me, and all of these texts that we're looking at right now says, you're in the grave. You're in the grave. See, Eve was tricked into thinking she could be like God by being immortal on her own. This lie, we have to call it like it is, friends, if it's offensive, this is coming from the Bible. This lie is one of the pillars of the devil's teachings. He taught Eve that she could be like God, that she could be immortal on her own. And do you remember what happened? God threw them out of the Garden of Eden. Remember that from Friday night? Or, or last the Saturday night, we talked about that. God threw them out of the Garden of Eden, cut them off from the tree of life so that there would not be immortal sinners. What makes us think that he's going to keep the devil there for, for eternity and have an immortal sinner? God's going to destroy sin. We talked about that Saturday night. And we may touch on that some more throughout this series, if time allows. The devil has actually worked powerful miracles down through the ages. Were you aware of that? Remember Job? We discussed Job and some of the things that he did. He calls fire to come from heaven. He calls a big windstorm. Were some of us here Saturday night? How many were here Saturday night? Oh, wow, good. Almost everybody. Very good. Now, the thing is, the devil has worked powerful miracles down through the ages as we looked at Saturday night. We saw that. And people who claim to receive their power through the dead on the earth today have you ever, remember I mentioned the seance? There are people who do that. They claim they're talking to the dead. And there's an example in Exodus chapter 7 also about the power that Satan used right here on earth. And that was when, do you remember when Pharaoh threw his staff down and his men? What happened? Who turned those to snakes? How do we know that? How do we know? What happened was when Moses threw his down? It turned into a snake and it ate the others, didn't it? So it shows the power of God over Satan. If we ever want to overcome Satan, and I meant to say this Saturday night, I thought about it when I was laying in bed. I said, you know something I didn't say? If we want to defeat the devil, we can never do it on our own. We can never do it on our own. Don't fool yourself into thinking that for one second. You have to have the power of God. You have to call on the name of Jesus to be able to do it. There's no other way. Next question. Could the topic of what happens when we die be more important than many think? I say yes. It's much more important. Now why do I say this? Take a look. Revelation chapter 18 verse 23. It says, by your sorcery, talking about Lucifer or the devil, once Lucifer once he fell... By your sorcery, all the nations were deceived. How many? All of the nations were deceived. 
In the end time, friends, Satan will use sorcery as he did in Daniel's day. And he's going to use it to deceive us all. Sorcery is a supernatural agency that is a demonic agency. It claims to receive its power and wisdom from spirits of the dead. <clears throat> You've heard that. Many today will try to summon their dead friends and relatives. I've known people that have done that. It's a dangerous thing to do. They believe that they can contact the dead. But since the dead know nothing, if you're trying to summon the dead and they're not there, who are we actually summoning? You're summoning the devil himself. Notice this verse. This makes it very clear. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, it says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder. For Satan himself does what? Transforms himself into an angel of light. Satan. The devil. The dark serpent. He was an angel of light. Remember what we said Saturday night? What does Lucifer mean? Light bearer. So it's pretty easy for him to transform himself into an angel of light. He can make you think he's doing something, and it's from God, but it's not. Posing as godly loved ones who have died, Satan and his angels have <coughs> deceived many, many people into believing that lie. Those who believe that the dead are alive become easy targets for the deceptions that the devil leaves. And like Adam and Eve, many will disregard the clear teachings of the Bible. And they'll believe the lie that the serpent said when he said, you shall not surely die. Mark? Yes? That is from 2 Corinthians 11, not 1 Corinthians. Thank you very much. I will, can you make a note of that for me? I'll change that on the slide. That's my Bible study partner right there. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. Pat Miller. She comes to the Bible study on Friday nights at my shop, and she beats me around all the time. <laughs> no, she's a sweetheart. I'm just playing. I'm sorry, Pat. She's turning red now. She, you're as red as your sweater. <laughs> you can smack me later. I'll take it. Look, friends, the truth is, like Adam and Eve, many who will disregard the clear teachings of the Bible will fall for that lie. That's the point I'm trying to make. We don't want to fall for the lie that the serpent, that the serpent teaches. Now, can the devil really work miracles? We kind of touched on this a little bit already, didn't we? It says here, and this is Matthew 24, 24. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. This is talking about in the end time, friends. All of Matthew 24, if you look at it very carefully, it takes you from the time that Jesus is living all the way through to the end of time, right before he comes back. And, and this is what he said, that this would happen. This proves that all miracles are not from God. Not all miracles are from God. Back in Moses' day... What did God command, I'm sorry, back in Moses' day, what did God command should be done to people who taught that the dead were alive? Ooh, that's a good question. If I'm teaching that the dead are not truly dead, what should be done to me under God's law? Look at this, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 27. A man or a woman who is a medium or who has familiar spirits shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. God insisted that mediums and others who claim to be able to contact the dead should be put to death by stoning. That's a painful way to go. Notice how the contemporary English version words the same phrase. It says, if you claim to receive messages from the dead, you will, you will be put to death by stoning just as you deserve. That makes it clear, doesn't it? This shows that God regards the false teaching that the dead are alive as something that's an abomination. He doesn't like it. Number 15. Belief in reincarnation is expanding rapidly today. Is this a biblical teaching? Well, Ecclesiastes 9.5. We look at this text. The living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. Psalm 104.29. You take their breath away, and they die, and they turn to their dust. Psalm 146.4. His breath goeth forth. He returneth to his earth. And that very day his thoughts perish. Friends, almost half of the earth believes in reincarnation. Were you aware of that? Almost half the population. What are we, 7 billion? 
Is that about right? Seven billion people? So three and a half billion people believe in reincarnation. This is a teaching that the soul never dies, but it's continually reborn as either another animal or an insect or some other form of life. And, and it, it's a different person or, or being with each generation. And if we believe the Bible, then we cannot believe in reincarnation because it's contrary to what the Bible says. Now, Whenever I discuss this topic with anyone, it seems like there are several questions that come up, and we don't want to avoid those. We're going to take some time to look at those. There are Bible texts that many of you are probably familiar with, and they're rolling around in your head right now that seem to be contrary to what, what I'm saying up here. So we're going to look at some of these texts, and one of the questions that always comes up, I don't think I've ever talked about this subject in Bible study, that somebody didn't ask this question. What about the thief on the cross? That's an excellent question. What about the thief on the cross? Didn't, didn't Jesus say he was going to go to paradise that day? Isn't that what it said? Well, I'm hearing a little conflict here. Let's, let's take a look at the verse. Let's take a look. You guys stay apart now. <laughs> Luke 23, 42. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today, you will be with me in paradise. When? Wait a minute. All of the texts that we've read so far indicate that it's at the last day. But Jesus is telling this guy today. Would you agree? Isn't that what it says? That's what it says. The interesting thing is further study of this text. And most theologians agree with this. Further study of this text will teach you some things. Let's take a look here. Did you realize that in the Greek language, which is the language that this, the New Testament was written in, Greek and Aramaic, there was no punctuation. So the Bible wasn't written with punctuation. It was added later on. And it was added by the medieval church. The medieval church was teaching things about uh, eternal hell and scaring, trying to scare people into coming to church. And they decided they'd put the punctuation where they felt it best belonged. The problem is if we make it fit our doctrine... That's not good. It has to flow with the rest of Scripture. Let's look at this verse again. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly I say to you, see, see the comma? Today you will be with me in paradise. That's how it reads. That's what it says in the King James Version, the New King James, the NIV. Many, many translations say this. But there are Bible translations where the scholars have recognized that there is an issue here because it doesn't flow with the rest of Scripture. And what's happened is, watch the comma move. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Does that change the whole meaning of that sentence? Let's back up. The placement of a comma can change the whole meaning of a text. And you say, well, wait a minute, how do we know that? How do we know, you know, this, this is, you're playing with the Bible now, you're changing it. Remember, there was no punctuation. They had to add the punctuation, and where they put it that will totally change the meaning. Now, we're going to look at another text, which will help you to see that this, this rendition is consistent with what the Bible is teaching. Mary Magdalene had just come to Jesus' tomb, okay? Remember that? Jesus was resurrected early Sunday morning, and Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb, and let's take a look at John chapter 20. John chapter 20, page 1049 in your seminar Bible. When you get there, say amen. amen. All right, I still hear some pages turning. I'm going to use this opportunity. I have my Bible in my hand. I'm a little dry up here. I was going to say I feel like a cotton mouth, but that's a snake. <laughs> John chapter 20, page 1049. Take a look at verse 11. But Mary stood outside by the tombs. Everybody there? Chapter 20, verse 11. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And she, as she wept, she stood and down. She stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. 
Then when they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away. They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they laid him. So somebody had taken Jesus, was her understanding here. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Or in verse 15, She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she, she turned and said to him, Rabona, which is to say teacher. So now she recognizes it's Jesus, right? But look what he says to her. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. Wait a minute. Look at that again. He, he told, according to the King James and where the Kamal was placed, he was in paradise with that thief that day. But here he's telling Mary, well, I haven't been there yet. Did he lie to the thief? Did he lie to Mary? According to all of the texts that we've read so far, what would have to be our understanding of this? He had not been to heaven yet. Where was Jesus? Jesus died. Where was he? He was dead. He was unconscious. He didn't know anything. You know the interesting thing, I've developed a, a two hour lecture on this. I won't give it tonight, I promise. <laughs> The interesting thing about this is that when Jesus died, the Bible prophesied that his flesh would not see corruption. He was in the grave for parts of three days. We're going to talk about this more Friday night, and it's going to be very interesting what you, what you hear Friday night. But the thing that I want you to understand is his flesh would not see corruption. How long did he wait before he pulled Lazarus out of the tomb? Four days. Jesus was in the tomb parts of three days. So even he was taken up before the tradition said it. And the reason why? Because his flesh couldn't start rotting. See what I'm saying? His flesh would not see corruption. Now some ask, where is paradise? I've had some people try to trick me with that. They'll say, well, wait a minute. It doesn't say that he's going to heaven. It says he's going to paradise. But where is paradise? Well, I didn't take time to do this, but it just hit me. Revelation chapter 2, I believe it is, verse 7. I can't give you a seminar page number, but Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7 clears this up. I can read it to you, or you can turn there if you like. Chapter 2, verse 7. It says, and this is Jesus speaking, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life. That's the tree that was in the book of Eden. Which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Where is God? So where is paradise? It's heaven. it's heaven. That's exactly right. So Jesus had not yet ascended to the Father. The thief was not in heaven. The thief is still waiting for a resurrection, very likely. He's dead. Another question. Doesn't the Bible speak of the undying immortal soul? Hmm. The answer is no. The undying immortal soul is not mentioned anywhere in the Bible. Nowhere. You can't find that text anywhere in the Bible. There's only one place, as I said earlier, where the Bible uses the word immortal. And that's right here. Now the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the only place in the Bible where you'll find the word. And it's with reference to God. Next question. Oops. Might need a new battery. We'll see. At death, the body returns to dust, and the spirit or breath returns to God. But where does the soul go? This is a little bit of review. Remember I told you we would have this again later? The body is the dust. The breath is the spirit. When you take the breath away from the body or from the dust, you <coughs> cease to exist. So the soul ceases to exist. Keep in mind, Genesis 2, 7, a little review. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of light, and he became, a man became a living soul. Again, it doesn't say anything about having a soul. I repeat myself a lot, don't I? It doesn't say a soul was given to him. 
It simply says he became a living soul. I'm going to use an illustration. I thought this was pretty cool. We got this light bulb that's on. Now, when you turn off a light, where does the light go? Watch. Isn't that cool? On, off, on, on. How about the clapper? Where did the light go? It doesn't go anywhere, friends. It doesn't go anywhere. We say it went out. Doesn't God say the breath goes out? The breath goes out, but where did it go to? Our breath, or our, our breath goes back to God. But the light goes out, where does it go? Nowhere. It just ceases to exist. When breath goes out, the soul ceases to exist. Because we need both body and breath to make a soul. Two things must combine to make this light light up. Two things have to combine. You have to have the bulb. And you have to have the electricity. Without this combination, a light is impossible. The same is the case with the soul. Unless the body and breath are combined, there can be no soul. And according to, Bi to the Bible, there is no such thing as a disembodied soul. You can't find that either. That's interesting, isn't it? And you're probably scratching your head and saying, all of my life I've been taught that the soul goes to heaven. What's going on? Study your Bibles, friends. That's what I'm asking you to do. Keep studying. Check me out. I might try to trick you sometime. I'll always tell you I'm trying to trick you. Actually, Pat, that's my excuse. I was trying to trick you, and you passed the test. You see that? Not really. I'm sorry. I just had to throw that out there. Does, does the word soul ever mean anything other than a living being? The answer is yes. It does. It could mean life itself. It can refer to your mind or your intellect. But whichever the meaning is intended, whichever meaning is intended, whether it's either one of those, the soul is still a combination of two things. Body and breath. And it ceases to exist at death. Next question. These are some of the controversial questions. Uh, Matthew 10, 28 says, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot ki kill the soul. Doesn't this prove that the soul is undone? Sounds like it. Do not fear those who, can kill, the who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Let's, let's see. Does that prove anything? I say no. I, I put that in there. That was my own slide. It actually proves just the opposite. Why do I say that? Let's look at the whole verse. Do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather feel him, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Can the soul be destroyed? According to this, in this case, the word soul means life. Remember we said it can mean other things? Life is a gift that will be given to the righteous at the last day. That's what we discussed. No one can take away the eternal life that God gives us. They can kill us now, but he can give us eternal life. Amen? Amen. Next question. Doesn't 1 Peter 4, 6 say the gospel was preached to dead people? I get this one a lot. Have you ever heard that? The gospel was preached to dead people in 1 Peter 4, 6. Well, let's look at it. It says, for this reason, the gospel was preached to those who are dead. They're dead now. But the gospel was preached to them while they were living. Does that make sense? Some, some of these texts, you know, when it was pointed out to me, I said, how did I miss it? How did I not see that? It was preached to them while they were alive. Next question. What about the souls crying out from under the altar in Revelation chapter 6? How many of us have ever read that text? Yeah. It, the, doesn't this show that souls don't die? They're crying out from under the altar. The answer simply is no. This cry was figurative. You know, in, in Genesis, let's see, Genesis chapter 4, around verses 9 or 10, it talks about Abel's blood crying out from the ground. But it was figurative. His blood couldn't cry out. So in, in the, the word soul in this passage of Revelation simply means people or living beings. It's the ones who have been slain for their faith. Remember what we studied at the beginning of this evening. And you need to remember this. God told Adam, you will surely die. Satan said, you will not surely die. Once Satan told the first recorded lie, 
again, <clears throat> I'm sorry, once, once Satan told the first recorded lie, it seems like it just took off and people started latching onto it. We have the deceased here in the castle. He's in heaven. Hopefully he will be. I hope to see him there. I hope to see my grandparents again. Where do the dead go when they die? Let's look at some new texts. Genesis 3.19 In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. Isn't that what God told Adam and Eve? After he had pronounced the curse? Right after the first prophecy that we talked about on Saturday night. We talked about that first prophecy in Genesis 3.15. That God would put a hatred between the serpent and the woman. And he said to Adam, you're going to return to the dust of the ground. Another text. <clears throat> Excuse me. For out of you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. That's pretty clear. Where was Adam before he was created? Where were you a hundred years ago? Is anybody in here over a hundred? Dad, don't say mom. I knew he was pointing at my mom. I knew he was going to be dead. Where were you a hundred years ago? You didn't exist. That's where Adam was before he was created. He didn't exist. God took the dust. He made a being. He made a body. And then he blew the breath of life into him and he became a living soul. I hope that makes it clear. Ecclesiastes 3.20, it says, All go to one place, all are from the dust, and all return to dust. Again, the devil's first lie, and you shall not surely die. This is the first lie ever told, and it's still being told today. It's dangerous, folks. Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 23. It says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus, then what makes us think that those cast into hell have eternal life? Have you ever thought about that? They obviously have rejected Jesus. So what makes us think they're going to live eternally in hell? They don't have faith in Jesus if they're in hell. They, they've rejected it. Would you agree? Am I out of line? Amen? Amen. They've rejected it. Okay. John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3. <clears throat> I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. When do we receive this reward? It's at, is it at the moment of death? No, it's when Jesus comes back or when he comes again. Notice what the Apostle Paul said to Timothy. He said, finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. I believe he will certainly be in heaven. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me when? On that day, and not to me only, but also to all who love his appearing. So in the context of this verse, when is that day? It's at Jesus appearing. Does that make sense? It's when he comes back. 1 Thessalonians 4.16. We read this earlier, but this is a beautiful verse. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Boy, I look for that glorious day. Question 16. Will the righteous people who are raised in the resurrection ever die again? We're talking about the righteous people. Hopefully we're all righteous here. Will they ever die again? According to 1 Corinthians 15, it says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, there's that trumpet glass again, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible, we read this earlier, has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to, to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Amen. It doesn't happen until Jesus comes back. So the answer is no. 
the righteous people who are resurrected will never die again. They will receive immortality. I don't know about you folks, but I'm looking forward to that glorious day.